Today's part two of creation versus evolution. Completely will destroy evolution today. But I didn't have to do that. God did that. God did that when he created us. Most college science professors that's the one I want it right there. To him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting shall. Okay. Most college professors never tell their students that the evolutionary model of one cell to man is totally based on assumptions. Not one provable biological, scientific fact can be had. So what's an assumption? It's taken for granted that something is real and supposed to be true. I am a six-day creationist. I believe God created the universe and everything in it in full maturity at the moment of creation. I also cannot prove this with scientific experiments, so this belief is also called an assumption by the evolutionist, by humanist. But it's called faith by a Christian. So what can we do about it? Let's look at what Christian faith is. Found this definition. The Christian faith is the experience of daily living in a dynamic and new personal relationship with God through a transplanted heart of godly passions and emotions and a renewed mind of godly thoughts and wise spirit directed personal choices. The key to this new experience of living, the essential factor to this key is trusting God, trusting his word. He's making you into a new person, a new creature, a new creation. He has renewed you from what you were, lost and dying, to alive and living. You repent of your own arrogant, selfish, willing choices and allow the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell in you, to guide you, help you. You believe Jesus Christ is God's Son. You believe it in your heart, your mind, your spirit, and you confess that. You believe that God can do the work to make you into a new life of service for God and give glory to God. By faith, I believe it to be true. Creationists know that God exists, but the Bible in his revelation to mankind and his word is truly knowable. You know that the Bible is true and real and that God exists. Now evolutionists likewise have assumptions, but their faith is blind. They have nothing they can put their faith on. So they take many steps to go from this molecules, one cell, to man model. I heard one creationist explain it. From their goo to you. They take you from goo to who you are. They don't do that. They can't do that. Evolutionists assume, assume that non-living chemicals gave rise to the first living cell in which in turn, mindlessly and randomly evolved into ever and ever more complex forms of life. There's not a single scientific experiment that can prove that. Molecules to man is not testable. It's not verifiable. It's not reproducible. It does not meet the standards of what science is. It cannot be authenticated. Now, writing as an evolutionist, G.A. Kirka lists the major assumptions of uh, evolution. These are the basic ideals that an evolutionist has to take for granted or is supposed to be true. All the molecules to man theories are based upon this. There's seven of them. Number one, that non-living things give rise to living things. Non-living things give rise to living things. Spontaneous generation occurred only once. That's not provable, nor is it repeatable. 
that viruses, bacteria, plants, and animals are all related. Not provable, not repeatable. That single cell life forms gave rise to multiple cell life forms. Not provable, not repeatable. That various invertebrates are interrelated. Not provable, not repeatable. And that in invertebrates give uh, rise to the vertebrates. Also, not provable, not repeatable. But here's the biggie, number seven. That within the vertebrates, vertebrates, the fish gave rise to amphibians, the amphibians changed into reptiles, and the reptiles into birds and mammals, and finally, you. So, under their philosophy, you come from a snake. <laughs> but we know who the snake is. That's also not provable, not repeatable. Molecules of man is totally assumed. What Dr. Kirkut has listed as assumptions is the whole of everything. There's nothing else in the teaching. And there's not a factual thing that's being taught that supports evolution. The process of moving from non-living to the first living goo to producing a cell to man and even a giant redwood trees are all an assumption that they believe all come from that one single cell. Dr. Kirkut clearly states that evolutionary assumption that all life is related to that cell. But now, through the use of electronic, uh, electron microscopes, science has discovered there are consistent differences in cellular substances of various kinds of animals. When studied under the microscope, living things of the evolutionary tree are seen to be not related to each other at all. What does God have to say? Well, let's ask. 1 Corinthians 15, 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another kind of flesh for beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. So God says, we're not all related. We don't come from animals. We didn't come from amphetamines, frogs. We didn't come out of a swamp. We didn't come from goo. Now, when did God say this? Well, over and over again since he created the word, since he created the earth. But 1900 uh, years ago, this was written. That's before sciences discovered there were differences. That's before these microscopes come along and the ability to check. We knew that from the beginning because God told us that. Essential that we believe what God says, even if it goes against what man says, and if it goes against everything that we think we know. I told you last week, I'm the product and you're the product of an education system that taught evolution as fact. And it teaches everything else as being hair fringed, religious nut stuff. Furthest thing from the truth. God created life and he sustains life, John, John 1, 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the, was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness cannot overcome light. Can't. If you have light, you'll never have darkness. Talking this morning about yard lights, and one sweet lady said that when her light, her power goes off, so dark she can't see anything. She has to have one. Somebody else said, well, I like it like that. But as far as darkness, if you turn on a light, it dispels the light. Now, if you have a light, it turn on darkness. What's it do? It don't come on. Darkness cannot exist in light. The Lord Jesus inspired his disciples and prophets to record the details of creation. Scientists are just now beginning to discover the truth. You wouldn't believe the amount of scientists that are now not evolutionaries, but creatists. Staggering. Various types of fish, or flesh in all the bodies of his earthly um, creatures. But did you know that there's different types of heavenly bodies? The stars are different from each other and not the same as the sun or the moon. 1 Corinthians 15, 41. 
The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and stars each have another kind. And even the stars differ from each other in their glory. Wow. The Bible never calls the sun a star. Never. Not one, part, not one part of the Bible ever refers to the sun as the star. It's always the sun, always the moon, and always the stars. Much as what's known about scientifically the stars is went from examining our sun. And then they transpose this out into trillions and trillions of suns, stars, heavenly bodies. They assume what they see with our sun is universal. But God says, and even the stars differ from each other in their glory. We're making some assumptions again. Astronomers estimate there are, try to put your head around this number, I've tried several times and quit, a trillion times a trillion stars. So every trillion stars, then you got a trillion of them. I mean, I don't, I don't know what kind of number that is. I'll be honest with you. The best English dictionaries have less than one and a half million words. The big ones, the thick ones. One and, less than one and a half million year, words. God doesn't estimate the number of stars. He has named each one of them. Isaiah 40, 26. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. You imagine at least a trillion, trillion names, and God calls each one of them by their name? Because of his great power and incomparable, incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. God controls them. Scientists say the universe should not exist. There's not enough gravity to hold it together. We should be flung off in every direction. So they invented dark matter. They invented this unseen, unknown, untestable dark matter. Gives us the body to hold it together. This is what does it, young man. Uh, no, God holds it together through Jesus Christ. I am so amazed at what people will accept as fact, but never check it to see if it truly is a fact. God is infinite in his power and his wisdom. If we used, I found this too, if we used every word in the English language, we could name less than 0.001% of the stars. Every word. From the biggest, biggest star to the smallest atom, the magnitude and complexity of this universe is unexplainable, except in terms of a creative designer. Scientifically, it's not explainable without assumptions, without adding things, without making conditions of. It just can't exist without those, unless there's a creator. It's above any chance of possibility of random choices, random things, or even human technology. The Creator God designed his creation in such a way that when mankind studies it, when we look at it, and I've had to do that over the last several years now that I've been working on this particular thought, I've had to look at it, and you have to Honor God for his creation, trust God for his creation, or be reduced to foolish speculation and vain imaginations. It might be worth reading this. Romans 1, 18 through 32. God's anger at sin. When you don't believe God, it's a sin. I didn't say it was a sin to question God. You can question God. You can ask God why, but you have to trust God and believe God. 
But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they know God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or give him thanks. And they begin to think up foolish ideals of what God was like. As a result, their minds become dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead, be, instead become utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-loving God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them. Do you know God can abandon you? He will turn you over to your own foolishness. So, he abandoned, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the other things God created instead of the Creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them through their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, uh, burned with the lust for each other. Men did sh shameful things with, each, with other men. As a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalties they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives become full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. As I read that list, I'm thinking, what do we have today in this world? We have wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip, all of which are abominations to God. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They boast in their sin. They boast in their sin. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. Yes, that's important to obey your parents. I'm sure everyone in here always did that faithfully all the time. <laughs> like most kids, when I was about 30, I apologized to my mother. She says, I don't remember a thing, Bobby. That's what good mothers do. Now, Jackie, on the other hand, remembers everything. They disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They just had some 9- and 10-year-old kids attack and beat up an older lady. I mean, 9 and 10, how do you do that? They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, and yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them. I believe that macroevolution is foolish speculation. It's speculative at best, foolish, and not verifiable. That's it for today. Next week, I'm going to end it up with creation versus evolution, part three. And I had it all written as one message. But when I seen the enormity of it, I just went down and kind of split it. So we got it. we'll get it in two parts, actually three parts, considering last week. Try to read upon it this week if you have an interest. Try to look at it if you have an interest. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you the glory. We thank you for creating us. We thank you for giving us Jesus Christ. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the many blessings. We thank you in all circumstances, Father, whether we're rich or poor, hungry or well-fed. Like Paul, we learn to be content. You provide our needs. Father, we give you the thanks 
I ask to be, that you be with all those who are suffering today, those that are depressed, those that don't really see the worth of lying. We just sung the song, Life is worth the living because he lives. Everything is worth the living because Jesus lives and he dwells. Dwells with us. Holy Spirit dwells in us. Father, we give you the thanks and the glory for that. I can't understand everything. I'm not smart enough, bright enough to understand everything. But Father, I 100% trust your word to be true. And proudly preach that and teach that. But I, pre I teach it with a humble heart, knowing how inadequate I am at explaining it. So, Father, I ask that you continue to encourage me, encourage this church, and be with us as we go forward into this new era. We ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.